tonight, the wonderful Ashley Hay, uh, who is an award-winning author of many works of fiction and non-fiction, and also is the editor of the Griffith Review. And um, she's also an incredibly great friend of Avid Reader, and we are so lucky to have her in our wonderful city. Please welcome Ashley Hay. <laughs> Thank you everyone. I never quite feel like I can live up to Chrissy's introductions. They're pretty extraordinary. Thank you, Christina. Um, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us by Zoom and in the room for the launch of the first edition of Griffith Review for 2021, GR71, Remaking the Balance. Um, as Chrissy said, my name's Ashley Hay and I am delighted to be able to bring you into this edition tonight through the work of some of its wonderful contributors. I'd also uh, like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land, the Yagara and Turrbal people, and as Chrissy said, to acknowledge the custodians of the land wherever our writers are and also wherever all our audience is tonight. To pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I'd like to acknowledge particularly the millennia of stories that have been told across the continent and the particular privilege of being able to gather together literally, but also technologically, to tell our stories here tonight. For those of you who don't know, Griffith Review is a quarterly journal, and we're hosted by Griffith University, and we explore a different theme in each edition. This year, all four of our books will intersect in different ways with ideas of sustainability. Now, the first book was conceived as an exploration of resources, literally animal, vegetable and mineral. Um, coming through the rupture of 2020 and the pandemic, we realised that we wanted to expand our focus to scoop in intangible resources as well. We needed to ask questions about how the pandemic might reshape our relationship with resources. And we wanted to ask the question of whether the pandemic itself might make some space for some critical reframing. We started to think about the words we wanted on the cover of the book, and we didn't want anything that implied that things might ever go back to how they were before. We wanted the sense of something new. We wanted the sense of balance, but we wanted the idea of, you know, something being made afresh. We found this beautiful cover artwork by Marianne Drew, who's um, an artist who has an association with Griffith University, coincidentally. Um, and we were so pleased the way her book, her photo, sorry, spoke to the title that we ended up choosing for the book, Remaking the Balance. We also wanted to step into a pretty fundamental question, which is how can we change what we do with what we have? So rupture and precarity are four themes that run through the four pieces we're going to explore here tonight. First of all, though, I'd like to introduce you to one of the poets from the book, Chloe Callistamon, whose work is featured in this edition. Chloe's going to read her poem, Urgent Biophilia, for us. I want to introduce you to Chloe, who's a photographer, a writer, a multidisciplinarian, which is hard to say, but it sounds like a good thing to be, um, whose poetry has appeared in journals including Cordite, Rabbit and Contemporary Australian Feminist Poetry. I'm really thrilled that we can come into this conversation with her words. Thanks, Chloe. Thank you so much, Ashley um, and Griffith Review for including this. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land here, the Yagara and Turrbal and wherever you are out there. Uh, this is urgent biophilia. Wrist deep in dirt for something less particular. Satisfaction more tasty than butter lettuce wilting. Kale curling towards sun. Cabbage grubs chew chew chewing. Cabbage butterflies pupating. Try a decoy mothmobile. Bean vines sprints 10 centimetres a day. A carrots after carrots, okay. A tender snap and crunch in sunset hues. Greens too fast for a single mouth. A campaign to run against the grubs. Time yet to prevent the brassica massacre. Only carrots have orange skin here. The parsley grow finely enough. Peas and beans go vine to mouth. Marigolds flame the gloaming. Mothmobiles flutter dusk, possums pace the wire. Somewhere between intention and chance, pulling a weed is in hand, 
planting a seed is out of hand, dirt under fingernails holds fast. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe, for bringing us into the collection very literally. So I'd like to start um, now by introducing you to the first of our four panellists. And what I'm going to do is introduce each of you, each of the panellists in turn, and ask them in a sense to introduce their work to you. So I'd like to come first of all to Professor Bronwyn Fredericks. Professor Fredericks is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland. And her piece in Remaking the Balance was co-authored with Dr. Abraham Bradfield, an early career researcher and research assistant at UQ. Um, Bron, when your piece explores issues of food security and Indigenous communities, and some of the unexpected outcomes of the pandemic in this space, particularly in highlighting, as you say, a food crisis that came under the spotlight through COVID-19, rather than actually being caused by it. Can you tell us a bit about the story and what drew you into it in the first place? Sure, Ashley, thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in tonight on Zoom or being here in person. In looking um, at the, the context of the remaking the balance, we first saw the animal vegetable menu. And if we think about the acknowledgements that we do on country and the ones that were just done earlier, and I'll speak to that later, but we can't do what we do without having that acknowledgement of country or understanding that every single thing we do, we actually do on unceded land. And so I want to make that point. But in looking at animal, vegetable, mineral, it's also the relationship of those things, along with people and all other elements. For myself, in terms of the um, the call for, call for papers and the call for essays, just thinking about that and thinking about the context of food security, people contact myself during the pandemic, but also reflecting back that for decades, people have been calling for greater food security in this country, irrespective of where people live, whether that's in remote localities, urban localities, or regional localities. Um, I do have a background in food, either servicing food, analysing food, and working with food in some shape or form. I happened to, in 2003 to 2005, actually work for Queensland Health um, in nutrition. And even at that time, we were looking at the Food North Project, which looked at food supply in the North, by the, the whole of North Australia. I was working on the Healthy Food Basket, which was looking at food pricing in Australia and other projects around eat healthy food, access healthy food. Food had already been an issue and food security already for decades. Swing into then 2000 you know, 17, when I was engaged by the Queensland Productivity Commission to look at remote and discrete Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as the commissioner, what was another issue that came up straight away again? Food, access to food, food security, food, in, food um, pricing, all of those issues again. 2020, 2021, and we're dealing with the pandemic and what is still an issue, access to food. So I think some things were so quick in terms of rolling out and the lockdowns, those things were not considered very well. People had trouble getting food. People had trouble getting, um, you know, with the food voucher cards, you would have seen a lot on the TV around the voucher cards. How do they work when you're in lockdown and you can't move around and drive across different towns and jurisdictions to actually access the place that you're supposed to use the voucher? What do you do when places like Salvation Army and the local church or co-ops can't operate in the same way they do? And here we sit, those people that are physically here, right close to West End markets, when the market's is not happening, and perhaps you live off the street or live close by a market where you don't have a vehicle to get food. It's okay for us in the city to be able to get, you know, Woolworths online or whatever store you use online. But what if you're in a place that doesn't have and what do you do and how do you do that? So it was really an urgent for me um, that that was an issue and we had people contacting, even in our office or students in the university saying, my family is having trouble. And I also monitored the social media and saw how that played out, how some communities mobilised themselves um, around how to try and get access and find more creative solutions. You can't tell people to start a market garden 
when you're in the middle of a pandemic in the middle of a lockdown. So I think that's it. And this is people on their own land, maybe, or on other lands, um, on traditional land. You know, for some people, that did mean, okay, we do need to go and do some of that work in terms of finding what's available in their local area. For other people, that's an impossibility. And certainly people in urban areas, that's an impossibility. So think about that, how that impacts on country, all different Aboriginal countries and the Torres Strait too. I gave an example earlier before we started, Ashley and everybody here, that uh, 2018, I did a radio interview. Someone sent me a photo. I had that photo checked out that it was real. But, you know, I can buy a can of S26, anybody here can, um, down the street here in West End, and maybe you online can buy it if you live in an area where there's, you know, readily accessing stores that sell it for maybe 25 to 25. But there was an incident um, in the Torres Strait where a can of S26 was selling for not 35, not 45, not $55, but $75. You have to question it, why we still have issues with food supply and those issues would still not work again. We wouldn't have a national food pricing inquiry last year if it wasn't still an issue in this country. We've got people where there's an abundance of food. We've also got issues where there are still difficulty of people accessing food. Before I put the mic down, I did want to say that my co-author, Abraham Bradfield, known as Abe, is also here tonight. And Abe also came in to really um, stress some of the important issues and look at some of the policy directions of what has been happening, but also what could happen going forward. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, and also, thanks, Abe, for being here as well. Um, I'd like to introduce everyone now to Robin Roberts, an agribusiness researcher with the Griffith Asia Institute, who's internationally recognised for her work in Australia's agriculture and food trade with Asian markets in particular. Um, Robin has written a beautiful piece for us on the quintessential summer fruit, the mango. Now, there are questions of precarity and security and supply bound up in your story too, Robin. Can you start by talking to us a little bit about the impacts of a change in climate on the mango from very tiny things like buds up to the sort of broadest levels of food chain supply or snakes? Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, everyone, for being here and also for zooming in. So the article itself is... I guess, based on my love as a Queenslander of mangoes. How many mango lovers in the room? Oh, good, good, the industry space. So the challenge with mangoes, of course, is there's two key timings with the growing of them. And in Northern Australia, as you probably know, things are heating up, it's getting a bit hot up there. So we need cool weather when the flowers are budding, and then we need warm weather when we're fruiting. So if there's a change in those, we won't get the product that we need. So at the moment, the farmers, particularly in far north, say Kununurra, are really experiencing a lot of challenges where fruit is just not bearing or we simply just don't have enough produce to supply the country. So, Thank you. Um, so can I give you a microphone? Because you're next up. I think I'll pass that one over. Um, and I would like to say a particular thanks to Joe Chandler who braved a plane and imminently closed borders to get here from Melbourne tonight. Um, yes, we're very grateful. <laughs> so you weren't anywhere near the Holiday Inn. Um, I'm so pleased the border was open. Um, Joe's a Walkley award-winning freelance journalist. She won the inaugural 2012 Bragg Prize for Science Writing and then the same prize again in 2014. And Joe's work focuses on climate science, on environment and health issues, as well as aid and development. Now, Joe's mighty, mighty piece for us in this edition is, I suspect, a piece she's been working towards through a lot of conversations and a lot of years. And I'm incredibly proud to be able to give it a home as the second piece in our Griffith Review Reportage Project, which was funded by the Copyright Agency's Cultural Fund. And I wanted to ask you, Joe. there are different elements of precarity and security at play in your piece. Can you tell us a little bit about the breadth and the scope of where we are with your story, but also the very unreportage process of bringing it together 
from one very, very small lockdown space in Melbourne. Thanks very much, Edmund. Um, I'm just hoping that the mantra doesn't turn out to be the Hotel California <laughs> and uh, don't ever leave. But um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. And, and I also acknowledge the unceded lands on which I am um, speaking to you tonight, the traditional owners and the, um, the land on which I work and live at home, the Wurundjeri, um, and where I did not <laughs> remove myself for a very long time um, deeply on that, on that land. Um, Okay, so like everybody, there were other, other plans. Is this okay? Yep. There were other plans for this reportage project and for life. I think I was supposed to be um, sort of floating around the Pacific, collecting stories around climate change and women in the Pacific who were responding to the climate change um, catastrophe and challenges. Um, and then I was locked down like everybody else. And it came out of that black summer hideousness. And I found myself in a, um, between the collision of black summer and COVID kind of completely paralyzed <laughs> with grief, distress. Um, and then I had a bit of an existential crisis around the journalism I've been doing for 25 plus 30 years now. And I guess questioning the validity, the usefulness of the kind of storytelling that I had been engaging with. Um, so in the middle of all that mess, I remember thinking, talking to you about the story of the collision of the climate, the climate COVID collision. And when COVID came along, I was deeply distressed at this bloody bug that was going to distract all of the momentum that we had started to see coming out of Black Summer. This sense of anger that suddenly, I remember 15 years ago, scientists saying, no one's going to believe it until it's upon us. And there it was, it was upon us. And people that had not engaged, not seen, you know, hidden away from it were motivated to act. And then along there came this other bloody catastrophe. And, and I was really frustrated and cross that it was going to steal the march on us. But then other stuff, things started to happen where I began to see it as a kind of a warm up act for dealing with Christ coming over the hill. And it was like a, you know, as big as this thing has been. And I guess we still haven't seen the edges of it yet. It did feel like a parable of all the things that we need to come to grips with, even though it's a more urgent and immediate threat for us here. Obviously, the climate threat is equally urgent and immediate for many of our neighbours, particularly in the Pacific. Um, but every time I saw those graphs on, you know, of, uh, sort of flatten, flatten the curve and I saw politicians suddenly pushing experts forward to to talk to us, to engage with us, and people listening to experts like their lives depended on it. <laughs> and I began to think, maybe there's something here. Maybe there is a narrative of hope, of re-engagement with the truth of science, with an acknowledgement that scientists can help us intervene to um, help us navigate a way, a path that brings less pain ultimately. So I guess they were all the things that I was trying to deal with the journalism crisis, the personal crisis, the grief around um, spending the black summer. I was actually babysitting a winery, speaking of, I was thinking of it when I was reading your agriculture piece that was bathed in, um, it wasn't my winery, it was a very dangerous thing. I was looking after 20 hectares of Pinot grapes and, <laughs> and they didn't lock the winery. Um, but there was this cluster, you know, the smog cloud of smoke sat on it for days and days. This is in the Mornington Peninsula. And all the winemakers were waiting and wondering, is it gone, is it gone, is it gone? And I was also looking after three large dogs and keeping them in the house because it was too smoky outside and trying to think and write. And I was paralyzed by my grief. So this story, I guess, was an effort to fight my way out of that paralysis and weaponize my grief. I think weaponize is a great word for what your story does in lots of ways. And as I say, thank you for persevering with it through what would have to have been some of the least comfortable reportage circumstances to find yourself in. 
Um, Leslie Ann, welcome to you, Leslie Ann Houghton. And I needed to Horton. Sorry, I needed to check Leslie Ann Horton. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm thrilled to have your memoir, Vertigree, in this collection. Um, Leslie Ann is a Queensland writer who's just completed her Master of Arts at Deakin University in Writing and Literature. Now, Leslie Ann, I think it's fair to say there are different elements of <laughs> precarity and security security in your story, um, all woven around the very strong mineral resource of copper. Can you tell us where your story takes us um, and also how you work towards the beautiful sort of plaited or braided style that you've used to really bring it to life and anchor it on the page in a way? Thank you, Ashley, and, and thank you for um, giving a home to this story, which is um, been really important to me and, and my family for so many years. I also like to um, acknowledge the, the people of the land on which we meet, the Turrbal and Yagara people, and also the Bunge, people of the Bunjaman Nation, uh, which is where my story was written. Um, my story is a memoir piece, and it's uh, set in the, the 70s when my family first left suburban Adelaide and moved to a small isolated copper mining town in the north of South Australia, up near Woomera. Um, and in that, uh, my, my sister, the story is about the death of my sister in that town in a car accident. Um, I've written this story over and over and over again. It's very fundamental to who I am, who I became, what our family became and didn't become. Um, but I, I never felt I could, could capture the complexity of, of the story and the depth of the story. Um, I did two programs last year, two um, fabulous online programs, one with the wonderful Sophie Cunningham, who I'm absolutely thrilled to be sharing the pages of this edition with, um, and the other one is with the beautiful Vivian Yuklovic, whose um, memoir, The Chronology of Water, is quite spectacular. Um, and both of those uh, programs get different techniques for the braided narrative, and one of those was to write your story in a different language, whether that language might be music or food or, or science. And, and I thought, what other language could I write this story in? And, and obviously, um, copper <laughs> came up. We were living in a, in a copper mining town. I was 12 years old, the oldest of five children. Uh, my sister was four years old. She was the youngest of the five of us. Um, and when I started to do some research on copper, what I realized is I've been collecting books about mining and copper without noticing secondhand bookshops and, and things, they, you know, they, they jump out um, and you must buy them as I'm sure everyone here <laughs> does also. And so there was, a, there was a lot there. And as I started to research that language of copper, the story just made more, more sense to me. And um, even though I had lived this life, I, I found, new ways to express this and it's not just about the story of what happened but the context in which it happened as well and, you know, i think that's what we're all talking about this evening it's not just what we're experiencing um, in terms of sustainability and, and climate but it's the context in which we're all experiencing that together so this this braided narrative um, came about and, and i i found different ways to express the grief um, and this is one expression of an individual family's grief and the impact of that but you know I think what Joe's just mentioned is I think you know perhaps at the moment we're experiencing collective grief as well and it's important to acknowledge that and I don't think we're generally very good at working our way through grief and expressions of grief and finding the hope um, on the other side of that that's what we've got to do. I've just realised that this panel and with Chloe as well, it, it represents exactly the thing that makes me um, really relish the privilege of curating editions of Griffith Review because we are all, all these voices are working around the same theme, the same idea, but coming from through such different genres and such different topics, such different research areas. And it's lovely to have this chance of like literally, I love the way they make it a conversation in the book, but literally having this kind of variety of conversations. Fabulous, thank you all. Um, Joe. I wanted to pick up on what Leslie Ann was talking about there and with the idea of hope. 
Um, and to talk about hope as a resource, you quote the work of Joanne Macy, and in fact, several of the writers in the book refer to Joanne Macy um, in the context of her idea of radical hope. Can you talk to us a little bit about the context of that, or radical hope in the context of climate change, and I guess your own relationship with radical hope and how that's changed across the years you've been telling these stories? Um, one thing I was just reflecting, uh, I'll quickly revisit the last question because I went off on a riff about me, I actually forgot to talk about the reportage. Um, so I'll just quickly mention the solution to my thinking about the climate COVID collision and what lessons might be there um, was I can't go anywhere to explore this, but I've had 20 odd years of exploring it and I have these really um, long lived relationships with some very eminent scientists who are right at the front line. And they are just a Zoom call away and they are also stuck at home and now might be a great time to reconnect with these people and exploit the fact that we have an existing trust and relationship and understanding of each other's work. And so that really became the bones of the, that's the reportage was sitting in one place and inviting in these experts and having a deep conversation about where we were with our climate work and how we saw COVID connect to it and with our hope and our grief. And so moving on to this question um, about hope, it was the undercurrent of every one of the conversations we had with the experts. Um, and I guess since the first time I got on the ground as a reportage reporter um, and had the privilege of going to places like Antarctica, uh, working with scientific teams, trailing them like the great adventurers off the edge of the known universe and sort of plotting, you know, what, what can we find here about the planet's story? Um, and on those journeys, watching, you know, even back as, you know, as early as 2005, 2006, 2007, I think was the, was the first time I began doing that, the sense of hopelessness was profound. And I was really interested in the idea of how do we carry that weight as experts, scientists, how do they um, manage the burden of knowledge of their expertise and sleep nights and have families and make plans for the future. And we would have these conversations, but I noticed that they did usually exactly what journalists do. They compartmentalise and they live this double life where they can separate. And at the same time, we had James Hansen jumping into the conversation and writing these papers saying, you must release, you know, you must abandon scientific reticence. You must shout loud about your distress and what you're seeing. And there was a, still a real resistance to that for a long time. But what's occurred in the last few years is I've seen that sort of fall away. So by the time we were having these conversations and they were zooming into me, there's certainly people like Terry Hughes, who's been working on the reef for a lot of years and he wears his bleeding, keening Irish heart on his sleeve, you know, with those tweets that he send, sends out, you know, the, the epic one about the damage to the reef and then we wept, you know, it just resounded around the world. I mean, Terry's book never pulled punches, but many of the others talked about this journey to be able to enunciate um, their anger and distress and thinking about hope. Um, and that conversation, I mean, Clive Hamilton wrote a book you know, Requiem for a Species in 2006, 2007, where he said controversially, you know, hope is a talisman that's going to distract us from what we have to do and we need to give that up or we will never get anywhere. It's a distraction and it's a kind of a, a sibyl and it's going to take us where we don't need to go. And I remember talking to him when I wrote my book on climate field science back then and going, no, I think I'm happy to hang on to hope and I dedicated my book then for... For my children and, and that was 2007, 2000, no, sorry, 2011. I wrote you know, dedicated to Ella and Liam in hope that you may live on an enlightened, friendly earth. And I guess it was two or three years ago reflecting on that thinking, but they don't. And that's when the hope swung to despair and Joanne Mason saved me. <laughs> um, and if anyone hasn't listened to it, there's a beautiful, I had read bits of Joanne's work in the past um, but I'd kind of forgotten it and I hadn't gone too deeply into it. But 
literally when I was drowning in distress, I listened to a Krista Tippett on being podcast talking to her and she was quoting these beautiful slabs of Wilkie and and I you know then sort of just went down that whole trajectory of I mean she wasn't weaponizing hope she brought a real beauty and warmth and joy to her hope and it was she still sounded like she thought it might be okay like gen, gen, genuinely um so I I did engage with her reading, engage with her writing and her thinking. And I use that kind of as the plank to get across the void <laughs> and find my feet again. And um, and it was a way to have these conversations with so many people who have been through exactly the same um, sort of uh, landscapes of, of um, hiding and coming back and seeing and, and, and acting ultimately. So, it's still a pretty precarious, we're talking about precarious, hope is precarious, but um, I guess between Joanne Macy and Rebecca Solnit and her idea of hope being, you know, the axe with which you break down the door, that's the kind of hope, the muscular hope that I'm trying to work with now. There was a lovely um, confluence between your piece and Sophie Cunningham's piece in this idea of exercising hope, of hope as a muscle that we had to kind of work out. There were a few stories I think where just these little intersections would, um, would pop up which was really beautiful. Um, Bronwyn I want to take a little step sideways from home um, to the to your piece which is called Food Security in Uncertain Times and I want to pick up on that word uncertain um, because as I said at the beginning one of the things we wanted to explore in this collection about different resources was the potential of the pandemic as a point of interruption, a point of disruption and rupture, and the potential perhaps of not returning to old ways of doing things, but rather making new systems and new structures. Can you talk to us about some of the opportunities for structural reform that you might be able to see in the wake of the pandemic in particular? maybe some of the most urgent new structures that we need to strive for and support. Sure, thanks, Ashton. Um, I just want to paraphrase this at the beginning by saying people in terms of hope and in terms of looking at uncertainty and in terms of doing, you know, that we in this place where we are, and I'm, I'm conscious that I'm on the corner of Boundary Street, which has significance for this community and my family as well. My great-grandmother used to live not far from here. Um, but also on the lands of other people, when we do the acknowledgement, what does that mean? Because I've got to have more than hope that you're going to get it one time, that everybody who doesn't understand this is not just going to say this, but actually understand what they mean um, in a lived reality so that we can move forward because hope can't, I can't continue to keep hoping that non-Indigenous Australians in this country that we now call Australia are going to do the right thing because history shows that it doesn't matter. I don't want things to go back to normal and Abe and I have had discussions about this. Why do what I want to go back to normal when normal is the state of injustice, when normal is racism, when normal is people don't have enough to eat, when normal is Aboriginal young people and Torres Strait Islander young people struggle with facing racism and discrimination at school or walking along any street, anywhere. I don't want that normal, so I want a rupture. I've got to do more than hope. I do have some hope. I can't not have hope in me within myself, um, but we've got to have more than hope going forward. And certainly in terms of the bigger work that Abe and I talked about in policy and looking at policy reform and change, it's about what have we got on the table right now? And we do have recommendations from reports. We have recommendations that address things like food insecurity and housing and land tenure through documents in this Queensland state that the Queensland Productivity Commission has produced and has produced. There's documents in other states around things around children there's documents in other states starting to progress around consultation with treaty. 
and I know that Victoria is further down that track, Queensland's about to go through with an other state park and the Northern Territory too. We have nationally at play the Uluru Statement, and it's one of the reasons why I wear heart imagery these days. And Uluru, um, Abe's been doing quite a bit of work around looking at the Uluru Statement and how that plays out too with me. But that is on the table. It was gifted to the Australian public three years ago. It wasn't gifted to the government. It was gifted to the public. So when you think about what you can what are you going to do? What are people going to do? How are people going to start raising racism beyond the next Eddie McGuire, beyond the next gap on TV, beyond the next gap on the radio? How are you going to have the hard conversations about issues that Aboriginal and Torres Strait people face every single day? How are you going to start talking about treaty? How are you going to start talking about the Uluru Statement within your own family? I don't want, and this is a very sincere plea here, I have nine grandchildren, all of which are Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander young people. I don't want them to go to forums like this and have to be having the same conversation when they have grandchildren and I don't want that for you either, that your grandchildren are living the legacy of what we didn't do now. That's all. Thank you, Ben. I want to come back to the Uluru statement a little bit later as well, because I think that's it's, it's such a powerful full stop in the piece that you've written for us. Robin, I want to come back to you now and to one of the things that I found most interesting and complicated to think about in your essay. You talked to us about um, new breeds of mango that are being developed and being trialled. They don't even have names yet. They've just got numbers, these things. And I find this, you know, it's fascinating and it's exciting as a lover of mangoes. But is there a tightrope that we have to walk between the expectation that we'll always be able to develop the next new strain of things that we'll adapt to, flowering at a different time, fruiting at a different time, rather than actually addressing the factors that are impacting on the climate change and the climate in the first place. How do we strike the balance between the excitement of that research and development work that gives us those new resources and addressing the core issues that are not just impacting agriculture, but are impacting all facets of life more broadly. Just a small question for you. Thank you, Ashley. Short answer, I don't know. Um, I, I think at the moment in, in a number of industries, they're trying to produce uh, fruits and vegetables with traits that can manage climate change but can also manage, I think, as a practitioner in this field, overbearing demands. And it's people out there who want mangoes 12 months of the year. We shouldn't have them. They're a Christmas treat. <laughs> so this is the, one of the challenges that I hear a lot, both in Australia, but also in Asia, is this driver for demand at the commercial end, which is you want Brussels sprouts, every day of the year. Well, I'm sorry, that's not when they grow. So do we need to rethink our demand as consumers? Do we then need to have a conversation with commercial agents and people like that? So farmers are, are doing what they need to do to ensure their livelihood. And the governments, the ag departments are doing what they need to assist those farmers to drive that. But there is, as Ashley said, a balance between the demand and the science requirement. And the new varieties, I have to say, though, that are coming out are earlier season mangoes that'll be out in July, August. One variety is March, April. So they were bred with traits so they could grow in those particular times of the year. So already stretching to 10 months. Um, and one variety is being bred so that it can be exported and manage the handling and the packaging. So it is a conundrum, it is a challenge, but any industry, if you 
you look at the grape industry, if you look at um, other areas such as your broad acre crop growing, they're trying to grow and manage for climate change and demand. So it's not an easy answer, but that's a broad description. Thanks, Robin. Um, Leslie Ann, I wanted to come back to you now, and this might sound a little bit odd, but adaptation was one of the ideas that I um, carried with me when I first came across your wonderful piece for degree, adaptation and adaptability. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about the idea of adapting pieces of life into narrative, but also using narrative maybe to adapt to the experience of those extreme pieces of life as well? I need to find you a microphone, sorry. Um, yes, adaptability, I think. Um, you know, I think what we experienced as a, a family at that point was absolute rupture. Um, and there was no going back to what had been. Um, but we didn't have the, the skills or, or capability. Certainly my parents didn't have skills or, or capability to adapt to that. Um, their marriage didn't last a year after my sister's death. Um, and as children, we didn't have the, the skills and, and capability to do that. Um, adapting, like looking at that narrative, as I said, I've, I've written this before, but this braided approach, a different approach to writing the story really gave me different access to things within the story. Um, it also gave me the a, a different access to conversations with my family. Um, we really rarely spoke about my sister. And even though I say this in the story, we, it was well, well into adulthood only in the last few years. My sister died over 40 years ago. And I'd say it's only in the last 10 years that we've actually spoken um, a little bit about her. Um, I, I wrote this story as part of my master's, believing that no one else would read it. <laughs> and then I got a call from Ashley, um, which sent the <laughs> temperature rising and I had to have a conversation with my mum about this which I was you know I was worried about but what it did was open up something really different for us um it also in writing the story I had I, I gained access to my, my mum was driving the car um of the accident and as I wrote the story I had some a little bit of insight into what might have happened to her and you know the strength that she had to have in that in that moment in the immediate moments afterwards um and you know the a greater empathy not that anyone ever made her for what happened but an understanding of um the strength she needed just to come through that um, she had we all had a, a lot of issues afterwards of course um but it the conversations that has opened up um, has been really important and not only for that but for a lot of other things that that came afterwards as well and so the the rupture piece we can't go backwards and you know, i want to pick up on what Rowan said though but there's opportunity for rupture as well and i really hope that um, the ruptures we're experiencing in our community in our society at the moment that we can move forward in a, in a positive way um, and, and build on the things that that are working because of the difference and not go back to the things that haven't been working. I think that picks up really um, nicely on the idea of connection, which is another thing that um, comes through, not just the sort of arrangement of all the different pieces in the book, but some of the pieces themselves. And Jo, um, I wanted to come back to your piece, which I'm not quite sure how many times I've read Jo's piece now. Um, and it's, it's about seven or 8,000 words long and I cry every time I read it. It is the most extraordinary, um, the most extraordinary piece. And um, I wanted to come particularly, you've structured, as you say, you structured this around this series of Zoom conversations, which was all we could do at the time. And you have this beautiful repeated refrain that runs through the piece, which is the thing we've all spent all year saying, I can hear you, can you hear me? And it just feels to me like the most extraordinarily apt line to weave through 
this narrative, which is about all the years of telling these stories and not, not being heard, not having them acted on. Um, how did that line resonate for you as the person who was doing all that telling? Uh, it, it, it was this refrain because I'm working upstairs in our, our very old terrace house built in 1885 and my partner is also a journalist and he's working at the dining room table downstairs and it was like echoing through the house the whole day can you hear me I can hear you can you hear me can I hear you and I started thinking about the ghosts in our house and thinking there is some um, I knew a little bit about some of them I knew a journalist who lived there from the Argus years ago um, and I knew that uh, there had been a Gallipoli veteran who had lived there for a period of time and it had been a, a girls' school at some stage. I'm not sure how they squeezed them in. It was pretty small. but um, And I started in this kind of mad locked-in moment. Of, I started doing history of my house and, and weirdly I was thinking about it one day when there was this knock on the door and a barrister who's the kind of local keeper of the local histories turned had put something in my letterbox and it was a photograph of my house taken in 1890 and there were these three little children sitting out the front on on the sort of the step of where the, where it meets the street and there's a woman a very elegant woman in a white dress upstairs outside my bedroom on the veranda and there was another um woman in an apron looking at the kids and i really was intrigued and so I started doing all this history who were they and what happened to them and I figured out who they were and I figured out that the little boy on the step had died in um, France before the end of World War One, and so I got really interested in this idea I guess of um, I, I feel like in some ways I entered a fourth dimension <laughs> of time where I couldn't go out in space but I started thinking back in time, I started thinking about this house that I occupied and how there's not much left of the old house, but there is this old timber banister and a stair that runs up and down. And every day I'm running my hand along it and I started thinking about the woman in the picture and about the boy who died in the war and, and thinking about what was here before that house was there. And I know the creeks that are around it that were part of, I say that um, Melbourne was like a, a a kakadu, a temperate kakadu of this incredible water spaces. And um, so this idea of can you see me, can you hear me, also resonated with the climate conversations and the COVID conversations and the post-truth conversations and the political conversations where we don't connect. We're screaming at each other, we're looking at each other, we're plugged into each other, but are we hearing and are we seeing what we're really worried about, what we're really thinking about, what we're really trying to tell each other. Um, so it was like this horizontal and vertical experience all whilst locked into this space. I was quite mad at this point. I, I really quite mad. I'm sure, that's not my phone. I can turn mine off. Yeah. Um, but I tried to figure out, I guess I got quite attached to the notion of these ghosts and then I was trying to figure out what I was doing with them and what I was thinking about and then ultimately I realised it wasn't about the past it was about the future and so then I sort of threw forward and it connected with this idea of hope that oh and that was the last piece the woman in the on the veranda and outside my bedroom in the white dress in 1890 um on the internet I found her great great granddaughter and she was living through the fires in um in Canberra so I got this sense I guess of continuity and and thinking about generations and and so in many ways it was about human connection at both the most intimate level and at a media level and at a scientific level and it just felt like it kind of captured all of those things. It's it's an ecosystem of a piece I reckon it's complex and beautiful and complete it's yeah I think it's wonderful. Um, Bronwyn, I wanted to come back to you now, um, Jo, I might just get you to hand that over and to pick up, I guess, on these ideas of connection, but also to pick up on your last point about um, the Uluru Statement. In talking about, the, in the way the piece explores the importance of incorporating traditional food systems in any framework of food security or nutrition, 
but also underscoring the importance of the Uluru Statement itself and, you know, particularly the importance of something like enshrining a voice to parliament. Can you talk us through the line that runs from the very micro of those traditional localised food sources all the way up to this extraordinary, the potential of a new democratic tool in a way? I think if we look at it, that it's potential to work both ways in terms of how people at the coalface have a say in every single thing about their life. So the community here that I have a say in what happens in that island here, in the same way that some living, you know, on Badu Island has a say in what happens to their in their lives, within their place, within the very existence of being there, and how that carries through from the localised community right through to national legislation that get rolls out. We can't keep talking about small community and community life because the reality is we also live under federal national you know our legislation that rolls out on top of us there's also the discussion of treaties and i'd be remiss if i didn't talk about them but i will say and and i talked about this today the song treaty that was very famous still is you play it anywhere people love it they'll say the words some people get up and sing and dance to it how old is it this year in June? 30 years. Treaties take a long time, not just to navigate, but once you've got one and the lessons we learn from New Zealand and the lessons we learn from Canada and other places, Canada, I can tell you, you can find us in a book. Every single treaty is just about being broken. They have no constitutional coverage. I was talking to somebody in ancient Rowan, New Zealand yesterday, who are working in a university where the university is trying to be treaty compliant. How old is that treaty? Do we want to be in that situation? Do we need to enshrine the voice in the constitution? We need protection, the legislation in a way that can't just be scrapped, that can't just be another form like an access. We get a new minister that says, oh, no, I don't like that. So we need that. We're owed that. And I think the Australian public needs to do it. And I will say before I finish up that it does filter down across all. We do need to see, for example, in the bush food industry, how that results into that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a greater say even in the industry and in those bodies, and that would ensure some of that flows through into regulatory forms. That doesn't happen in Australia. People can talk about it and mystify it and exoticize it all they want, but the reality is that that industry is basically controlled by non-Indigenous interests. Go around to any university and the ones that drop that research or any institute are indeed non-Indigenous people who may have a few Indigenous people as a diet, few elders, Where's their postdocs? Where's their PhD students? Where's the do it and get paid, even as lab techs in those places? Okay, so that's the reality and how it results and how it flows from go to woe down and go to woe from down up. Um, and the last thing I do want to say is um, I don't want to hear anymore. We've come a long way. It's one step at a time. Because I want to ask non-Indigenous Australians can't you walk faster? Can you only do slow steps, right? Because that's how it results in reality too. I want to ask you, what are you waiting for? And lastly, what are you scared of? What are you afraid of making it happen? I've got so many more questions, but I can see Fiona and Chrissy standing over there, which I think means if there are two of them, I really do have to stop. I've got the numbers on me now. Um, I'm presuming I'm out of time for questions here and questions there. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah, that, that is accurate. But um, we do have time at the sliding table for the people here and no one on the... <coughs> great. Well, not great. Thank you for all being there and not asking things. Um, do, would you like me to finish very rapidly now? Um, I, I was going to say something here, but I think it helps. And so can't hear a project. <laughs> And firstly, an apology to the speakers for the microphone. Uh, we'll get it fixed ASAP because it was dropping. 
it was dropping in and out. So yeah, my apologies. So I'm Fiona, I'm Fiona as a reader, and I just want to talk very briefly about a wonderful um, arts project that we're involved in. It's called Chrysalis Project 4101. It's an artist-led economic um, stimulus um, program that two local women started in West End, and we're very proud to be involved in it. And our project is that we're going to have this amazing mural on the outside of Abergreda. So you'll be able to see it from Boundary Street. And we're um, by the highly acclaimed Indigenous artist, Vernon Arkey. And he is going to wrap us in um, the names of um, non-Indigenous um, authors and then overlay with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander authors' names. And so the project is called Word Up. Um, and the byline is see their names, say their names. And we're so thrilled, we're so excited to be part of it. Um, it's um, part of um, this Chrysalis Project 401 is that it is encouraging um, philanthropy from the community. And that's what we're doing. We're going out, we've raised almost $30,000 already. Um, our target is 50, because this project is just kind of growing and growing and growing. Um, and so I encourage everybody to jump online. There is a window display. Um, there's a QR code, so you can go in and have a look at it there. And it's small donations are just as important as larger donations. Every penny will make this thing possible. I'm incredibly proud of it. I was so honoured. We, we went out, it was just, um, Vernon came on board. We didn't know what he was going to do. He had this open brief and he came back with this most powerful thing that grounds avid reader and um, the importance of authors. And it's also about reclaiming the boundary street as well. It's going to be big out. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, very much. Thank you everyone. That feels like a beautiful place to finish. Um, I would like to thank Abbott as always for having us and thank all of you being here with us, whether you're you know, in the room or not. I'd like to apologise particularly to Robin, who I had two more questions for that we didn't get to. I'll ask her later. Um, but thank you so much for supporting Griffith Review. You can buy copies of the book. The authors are available to sign the copies of the book and um, we'll have another one for you in May. Thanks very much, everyone. Signing table set up inside, as I said. So um, we're going to get the authors um, to the signing table now, and then um, the bar's open. We can have another drink, have a chat, ask those questions you're being asked. Which is good. Yeah, and see you later, everyone on Zoom. It's wonderful to see you. <laughs> see you later. Oh my God.